would like to uh, introduce Sandra Espada Santos, and she is the facilitator for the U.S. Virgin Islands College and Career Readiness Research Alliance, which is one of the eight research alliances supported by RHEL Northeastern Islands. And uh, Sandra, I want to uh, hand it over to you and Helen and Denise this afternoon and wish you a, a session. And we'll also want to make sure Sandra has the, just because we're a global webinar here doesn't mean we've mastered the, the mute button. So we want to make sure. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> that was a great reminder because I was half, half my speech. <laughs> Thanks yes, a lot. Right. I'm sorry all about this. I no am problem. Sandra Espada. I am the uh, RELNI liaison to USBI and Puerto Rico. And I am also the facilitator to the Virgin Islands College and Career Readiness Research Alliance that RELNI is um, supporting in the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands uh, territory. I am sorry not to be able with the group that is meeting in the University of the Virgin Islands today in their St. Croix campus uh, for the uh, peer network um, of the striving readers. The, they are having uh, their uh, annual meeting in, in that location, and this session is part of their of their meeting. And uh, I uh, wanted to be there, but some major forces didn't allow me to do so. Uh, so uh, my apologies. Uh, but we have had great uh, colleagues in the university supporting us with the technology and in the coordination of the uh, agenda for today for this session. Um, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the support of the um, Education Commissioner of the Virgin Islands, Dr. Sharon McCollum, also of the Assistant Commissioner, um, Ms. Chermaine Hobson Johnson, of the St. Croix um, Superintendent, uh, Ms. Colleen Williams, and um, to the um, Peer Exchange Network uh, Program Manager, uh, that has also allowed us to um, uh, to be a part of this meeting, Ms. Rosemary Fennell, and a special thank to Ms. Denise Gomez. Uh, she is our local hero in uh, the coordination of this event. So thank you all for allowing us to be with you today. Uh, the agenda that um, we uh, have planned for this meeting uh, today is a one-hour session. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I will hand this, um, this session to Dr. Helen Duffy, uh, Senior Research Analyst at the American Institutes for Research and also a rel um, colleague. Helen will be providing the main presentation on the topic of developing culturally responsive college and career readiness literacy skills and why um, the links to what's happening in the Virgin Islands uh, over the P16 um, collaborative that they are uh, developing um, uh, is, is important. Uh, we will also invite Ms. Denise Gomez from the Department of Education in the Virgin Islands to share with us some reactions and uh, local implications about um, uh, to the P16 collaborative and the, and the work they're doing uh, this year in particular, based on the uh, remarks from uh, Dr. Duffy. And then we will like the group in the uh, webinar to participate uh, using the technology that this platform allows. As Peter Orn was explaining, there are several ways you can do it. You can uh, use the chat room. You can use the uh, raise the hand, the little body that is uh, on the top of the screen and let us know that you want to uh, communicate in some way and uh, we will find a way to uh, hear your comment. We, we want to, to hear or to read or to read your comment. We, we really want to engage you in this conversation. Um, my welcome to all the colleagues from the Virgin Islands that are in here and from other jurisdictions um, uh, that have taken time away from their 
these lives to, to participate here. Moving along, let me talk very quickly about what the College and Career Readiness Research Alliance in, uh, in the Virgin Islands is doing. Uh, we have been supporting the uh, Department of Education in the territory and other education stakeholders since 2012. Um, this is our fifth year there. And uh, the focus of the alliance has been throughout this year is to support the, um, the establishment of a P20 workshop, but um, that, that's what the goal says, pipeline to support uh, the preparation of students for post-secondary uh, success. Uh, so far, as I already mentioned, the territory is um, uh, well underway with a, what they are, they have been calling the P16 collaborative, which is a uh, um, work done in, uh, in coordination with the Department of Education and the University of the Virgin Islands. And as we will talk later today, uh, they are focusing this year specifically on an activity that is looking to uh, propose recommendations for um, a strategy to support the uh, recruitment, retention, and development of teachers and educate, educate, educator leaderships. Uh, sorry, educator leaders in the territory. Uh, we as an alliance have also provided through the activities that the RELNI uh, fund, the um, applied research and analytic uh, research and technical support uh, on indicators and measurements of college and career readiness and success. There are a couple of specific um, studies and um, workshops that um, we have provided. Uh, all of these activities are done in coordination with the Department of Education and um, several staff um, individuals from, from the department and with the collaboration of other entities in the territory, uh, including the University of the VI, the Board of Education, and the Community Foundation that has been a great partner to this alliance. Uh, for many years, and also to the RELNI. Uh, the core planning group, which is the uh, group that provides strategic thinking to the work that we do, uh, this year is um, composed by the individuals that are listed in, in this slide, the commissioner, the assistant commissioner, the superintendents of the school districts, the Director of the Planning Research and Evaluation Office at the, uh, the Department of Ed, the um, Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University of BI, and, and more recently the, um, the new Chair of the Board of Education. We have invited her to participate and it's uh, tentative, uh, but I, I really like to have their, her participating here, so that's why I am including her, Ms. Mary Moorhead. Um, very briefly, again, the, um, specifically on what the USBI is doing on the P16 collaborative, which is like um, uh, the reason of this session today, they, uh, they ask uh, us to provide support in developing a teacher pipeline strategy for the territory. To do that, they, um, uh, this collaborative that is coordinated by the, um, uh, the, the commissioner and the assistant commissioner and the provost of the university. They have identified a very um, interesting uh, group of stakeholders in the territory. They have already met uh, and identified the, um, the work plan that they want to develop in the next few months. Uh, and their goal is uh, their goal is to provide policy recommendations to the Department of Education on the topic of teachers and educators, um, leaders, uh, entrance and uh, retaining of them in the territory. The work of the Alliance is to provide the research and the resources that uh, are specific to the topics that they are exploring and providing planning tools and facilitating their their meetings. Uh, during that process, we have uh, counted with the uh, 
expertise of Dr. Helen Duffy and uh, Ms. Beth Bradway, and um, that's why Helen is your speaker today. She wants to address the uh, the uh, the topic of the uh, the culturally responsive um, college and career readiness literacy skills and that and how the uh, uh, the work of the teachers' pipeline can be influenced by by those. So Helen is, as I mentioned, uh, a senior researcher at the American Institute for Research and also a, a member of the RELNI uh, network. She has extensive experience providing technical assistance and designing and preparing large-scale evaluations. Um, she has uh, worked with the National High School Centers, and um, she is uh, an expert on the topic of college and career readiness. Um, so, without further ado, I know that I am missing a lot of your uh, of your um, of your work, Helen. But this is a short introduction. So, with my apologies, I'll leave the audience to you. Thank you very much, Sandra. So, um, we have several goals today. Um, one is to just provide a little bit of background research related to literacy and its role in college and career readiness uh, in the USDI context, and to think about um, the ways in which culturally responsive literacy instruction can help um, develop those skills in our students. So I've been actually asked to connect the dots uh, across four different topics. So I'll lay those topics out. One is literacy. One is college and career readiness and success. The third is culturally responsive instruction. And the fourth is the work that we're doing in the USBI around the teacher pipeline. Um, so I'll begin by talking a little bit about literacy in the 21st century. Uh, connect those notions to um, uh, culturally responsive instruction, and then we'll talk about and think about together what the implications are for what teachers should know and be able to do, um, particularly uh, in the context of the USDI. So I want to get started with a video that I hope to use that um, can demonstrate some of what I mean by 21st century literacy tools and practices. Uh, we've been granted permission to use the video by the Center for Digital Storytelling, and as you watch and listen to the video, I want to, I, you know I want to ask you to think about literacy uh, and where in this video clip you see evidence of literate activity. Um, and as you think about these things, I want to feel free to respond in the chat box on the bottom uh, left portion of your screen. Um, and if you've joined by phone, I need to ask you to mute your telephone and turn on your computer speakers, because that's how you're going to hear the video that we're going to watch. Um, the video clip is just a little under four minutes. So let's go ahead and launch that. My dad asked me if I wanted to go with him to let it go, but I said no, I wanted to hang with my friends. I had shown the fish to my grandpa, and he said it was too bony. I just wasted my time catching a fish that I wouldn't get to eat. I've been fishing since I was 18 months old, when my dad would take me to Lake Washington on the weekends. I like fishing with him, even though we hardly ever get to talk. I love the smell of fish cooking on the stove or over a fire. I like watching him prepare the fish and cook them. The other thing I like about fishing is the peacefulness. No one's asking me to do anything. I love just being alone with my dad. 
Last summer I caught an 18 inch carp. We were on a rafting trip and we stopped at a clay cliff to swim. My dad fished while my sisters and I swam. Then I took over the pole. I caught three rainbow trout. Only one was the keeper. I cast it out one more time and let the line sit for a while. The current took the line down. I reeled it in slowly, and I noticed that the line was kind of heavy. Maybe it was dragging on the bottom of the deep clay bank. The tip of the pole started bending over, so the top was almost even with the reel. Maybe it was a snag. I tried to break the line and my dad came running to see what I had on the other end. I reeled faster and harder until an 18 inch golden carp came to the surface. The biggest fish I've ever caught. Grandpa said it was too bony to eat, but the fish had already given its life. So my dad asked me if I wanted to go with him to let the body go down May Creek, but I said no. A couple of months later, I met this native man, Roger, and he told me the story of the salmon people and the one boy who didn't return the salmon bones to the river, but threw them in the bushes instead. The people were born without bones in the salmon village until he went back and took the salmon bones and put them back into the river himself. And that's when I regretted it. Not going with my dad to put the cart back in the creek. Because it gave its life for nothing. And I didn't show it respect. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so ideally, uh, well, first let me just say um, you now need to turn off your computer speakers before you unmute your phone lines if you're listening through the phone. Um, so ideally I'd be with you in person to engage in a conversation about what you all noticed uh, in the video, um, but because of the kind of technical limitations of this medium and the fact that we're streaming across multiple sites. Um, I can only see your entries in the chat box. Um, and I'm not currently seeing any any entries in the in the chat box. So I'll just go ahead and uh, begin sharing some of my own observations about the video. So um, the first thing I want to note are the tools that Cody used uh, to produce this particular piece are multimedia tools. Um, computer photos, sound effects, music, um, and in addition to more traditional paper and print texts, students are going to need to learn how to engage with these kinds of texts critically, um, both to become critical consumers and skilled creators of these texts. Um, and he uses these tools to, to really focus his audience. For example, when he includes the sounds of the fishing reel in the background as he continues to tell the story. He also demonstrates um, a number of skills related to narrative, um, including, for example, the use of devices that increase suspense. Maybe it was, maybe it, the hook was, dragging on the bottom, maybe it was, maybe it was, and um, so so the use of that device kind of increases the suspense. Um, and he opens the narrative, interestingly, with one version of the tale. He says, my dad asked me if I wanted 
the go with him to let it go. We don't even know what it is yet. And he says, uh, but I said no and went to hang out with my friends. I had shown the fish to my grandpa, and he said it was too bony. I just wasted my time catching a fish that I wouldn't get to eat. That's one version of this tale. But then what he does is he goes on to sort of uh, complicate that version. Um, and as the narrative progresses, progresses, we see this initial version get quite a bit more complex. Doing so, I think, demonstrates that stories of events in our lives take many shapes um, and have multiple versions, multiple interpretations. Um, however, perhaps even more powerfully, uh, Cody's piece demonstrates his capacity to listen uh, across generations and, in fact, to take to heart what he hears and, and learns as a result. So uh, let's see. Now I need to go back uh, and advance my slides. So um, um, I see the um, comment that the photos were descriptive as to identifying how big the fish was. I think those, those things are true. What, what happens in these multimedia texts is the producers of these texts need to think uh, long and hard about how one sort of um, avenue for telling the story kind of complements or, um, uh, uh, well, how it, how it complements the, the story and the purposes of, of the, the narrative. So I want to talk a little bit about literacy. Um, what it is, what it isn't, um, using Cody's video kind of as a, um, an anchor for, for uh, discussion. And um, the National Council of Teachers of English uh, defined literacy as a collection of cultural and communicative practices that are shared among members of a particular group. And if we agree with that definition, it stands to reason that uh, as a society, um, or as society and technology change, uh, so does literacy. And decades of research point to the important observation that literacy cannot be understood apart from the social contexts in which it develops. I think probably some of you are familiar with the work of uh, Shirley Bryce Heath. Um, maybe less familiar is um, a little bit earlier work done by Scribner and Cole, um, who, who sought to test whether school-based literacy uh, could explain variations in how adults engage in tasks that require them to use abstractions, logic, and memory, because there were people who were claiming that literacy conferred upon those who were literate uh, kind of advanced cognitive skills. And so Scribner and Cole wanted to find out if this was actually the case. So what they did is they, um, they designed a research project uh, in, uh, with the Vi people, which is a small Liberian population. And in their research, what they did is they asked participants, some of whom had more years of formal schooling than others, to perform several tasks. And they hoped to gain a better understanding of how different social situations might affect and change human thought. What they discovered was that, interestingly, literacy helped the most not with the task itself, but with the explanations that participants provided about those tasks. Um, and I quote from them. They say, the, the most impressive finding is that formal schooling with instruction in English increased the ability to provide a verbal explanation of the principles involved in performing various tasks. Justification given by schooled individuals were more tasked by others. So Scribner and Cole and many researchers who followed found then that literacy um, should be approached uh, as a set of socially organized practices 
which make use of symbol systems and technologies for producing and disseminating it. So again, think back to the, the tools that Cody had at his disposal to tell the story that he told. Um, so fast forward to the early part of the century um, to a report authored by Bian Carosa and Snow called Reading Next, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. According to that report, while our, our focus on increasing the numbers of third graders who read at grade level presents significant challenges, those challenges have sort of distracted us from perhaps the greater challenge of getting students to comprehension, reading to learn, and reading in the content areas. According to that and other more recent reports, literacy is more than just a set of discrete practices. Readers approach texts with different stances, motivations, purposes, and expectations to form what O'Brien, Stewart, and Beach call a more ecological approach to conceiving of literacy that can begin to account for its situated nature. So the world we live in and the young people we teach are dynamic. Um, in school settings, we focus our attention oftentimes on school-based literacy practices. We focus on discrete skills such as decoding, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, background knowledge uh, as tools for literacy and, co and comprehension. And I don't deny that the importance and utility of those skills and those distinctions um, because people who read proficiently draw upon those skills automatically and must be taught and have time to practice in order to learn those skills. And yet the 21st century technologies are redefining the skills that students need in the world. Web-based technologies, for example, challenge traditional skills such as left to right and top to bottom processing of text. And they're nearly always characterized by hyperlinks that draw readers into deeper and more specialized content, not in the linear, linear way of uh, printed texts. So for nearly a decade, um, many researchers have been saying that traditional paradigms of literacy need to accommodate these new texts. The earlier slide I cited uh, work of um, Donna Alverman and others who, who make this claim. Uh, and as we'll be reminded in a moment, the Common Core Standards are actually also an attempt to acknowledge these new textual landscapes. As Tom Thomas Carroll, who is uh, president of the National Commission on Teaching and America's Future, points out, learning is no longer preparation for the job. It is the job. In a world in which information expands exponentially, today students must learn to be knowledgeable navigators, seeking and finding information from multiple sources, evaluating it, making sense of it, understanding how to turn information into knowledge and knowledge into action. So what does it mean to be college and career ready? Well, I mean, a number of people have uh, weighed in on this. Um, our knowledge um, in the 21st century economy, in this global economy we live in, demands a different kind of preparation than has historically been available to students. Um, some folks are uh, calling this deeper learning, a, coin, a term that was coined by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, I think, around 2010. And this set of educational outcomes includes six interrelated core competencies, mastery of academic content, development of critical thinking and problem solving, the ability to work collaboratively, effective oral and written communication, learning how to learn, and developing and maintaining an academic mindset. The three um, buckets that you see, the cognitive, interpersonal, uh, and intra intrapersonal and interpersonal, are the three buckets that the National Research Council came up with. But the, the work of the Hewlett Foundation actually maps pretty nicely um, on, onto the, the, these three buckets of work here. 
And the Common Core state standards represent another parallel effort to define the skills students require for success in the 21st century. I selected this particular excerpt from the Common Core Anchor Standards, which uh, describe broad standards uh, and define the skills and understandings that all students must demonstrate. Note here the importance of evaluating content, understanding the role of diverse media, and the multiple genres uh, that students must read and produce, including analysis, reflection, research, and the like. All of these things have major implications, not only for the way teaching and learning is structured in K-12 classrooms, but also for the way we prepare and support ongoing learning and development for teachers. So let me illustrate this um, using a couple of um, print texts, which you're probably not going to be able to read very well because of the size of, of the font. Um, and we don't have a lot of time today to um, talk about this, how this relatively simple text works. But I want to illustrate some of the complexities of what teachers need to know and be able to do using the, this text and a couple others that follow. So typically what we do is we tell students essays have to have five paragraphs, and they include an introduction, three body paragraphs, and a conclusion. And yet if we study real texts, especially those that students might be familiar with, they rarely fall into that organizational structure. Furthermore, we often neglect to account for a text's purpose, its intended audience, or the more specific features of introduction, body, and concluding paragraphs. So the text that appears on this slide is a student problem solution essay. Um, generically, it does include an introduction, body, and a conclusion. And yet if we look at the sentence that make up the opening paragraph, we should ask ourselves, what specific role does each of those sentences perform? So the first one identifies the topic or situation. The next three describe the topic in more detail. And the final sentence of the opening paragraph states the problem. In order to use texts as models for students, teachers must understand more deeply what makes these texts work or sometimes what makes them not work so well. So here's a, an example from an introductory paragraph. How would you feel if you knew at this moment that some criminal is writing your name, address, and social security number on a credit card, or on credit card applications and plans to charge thousands of dollars worth of merchandise on those credit cards? So this is one approach to writing an introduction. It opens with a provocative question. And for certain purposes and certain audiences, this particular strategy might be a great, um, a, a great way to go. The second example is about the same topic but uses a different strategy. So identity fraud is the fastest growing crime in the United States. In 2004, over 9 million Americans, or approximately one person in 24, became victims of identity fraud, identity, identity theft at a cost to the economy of $52.6 billion. So this second example opens with a surprising fact. Digging into the ways in which these texts are structured is just one of the many important aspects um, that teachers need to be able to do as we help students understand how these texts work so that they can then make these intentional choices themselves as they create their own texts. Again, I think the Common Core state standards have tried to make this clear that students need opportunities to understand how texts work in multiple disciplines and not just in English language arts. So here, students could be asked to notice these different opening strategies and think about when one might be uh, more appropriate than another. So where and how does culturally responsive teaching come into play? Well, I think if, if we agree that social context and purposes are so important for literacy and learning, having a deeper understanding of those social contexts and purposes is key. 
it's essential if students are going to engage in these practices with us. So what is culturally responsive in, uh, teaching? Um, if you look uh, at some of the, the um, blogs and, and some of the questions that people ask about it, um, it's, it, it includes but is much, much more than just selecting texts that reflect the backgrounds and experiences of her students. Culturally responsive teaching means um, connecting students' cultural knowledge, prior experience, and performance styles to the academic knowledge and tools that we're trying to help them acquire. Uh, culturally responsive teachers understand that mastering academic or school-based knowledge involves not one, but multiple avenues to mastering information. Culturally responsive classrooms so that students can take ownership of their own learning and that of their peers. It requires explicit instruction around ways to explore and ex express differences, differences of opinion. And, those, um, and culturally responsive teachers are socially conscious and have affirming views of, of students from diverse backgrounds. They see themselves as responsible for and capable of bringing about change to make schools more equitable. They understand how learners construct knowledge and are capable of promoting knowledge construction. They know about the lives of their students, and they design instruction that builds on what their students already know. Decades of research have pointed to the out-of-school literacy practices of communities that have historically been poorly served by our educational systems. And in these um, researchers have tried to build, encourage teachers to build upon those out-of-school practices for school success. It's something I've called taking an anthropological stance in our teaching, where we learn with and from our students. And it draws upon what Gonzalez, Mole, and Amante have called the funds of knowledge that students bring to school with them. So if you didn't already know it, um, I hope you can see how challenging this teaching endeavor is. As literacy teachers, we need to know about those components of literacy, the phonemic, lexical, orthographic, semantic, and syntactic systems that comprise language use. But we also need to understand how those systems are used in practice, not just in schools, but in the world outside of school. We need deep understandings of genre and how language work, works or why and how it sometimes fails to achieve its desirable, uh, desired purpose. In order for students to become critical consumers and producers of text in whatever media, we need to be the bridge between the strengths and skills they bring with them, the acquisition of academic literacy, and some of the broader purposes of literacy we encounter in the world around us. So it isn't an either-or proposition. It's both and. So um, through the REL, uh, Beth Ratway, uh, Sandra, and I have been working with uh, the USDI uh, and the P16 Collaborative for about two and a half years. But it's only in the last uh, probably 10 months that we have um, begun to focus on the role of the teacher pipeline in the USVI. In a moment, I'll turn this over to my colleague, Denise Gomez, who's going to discuss the most recent work of the, uh, uh, of the task force. Um, but for now, I hope you've seen some of the connections uh, across the ways we define what it means to be literate in the 21st century and how those definitions shape teaching and learning in school and define what teachers need to know and be able to do. Narrow definitions of literacy make a deficit approach to teaching and learning much more likely because they shape literacy as something students need and don't have. But if we learn to see literacy as a complex set of skills that students acquire and use across multiple contexts, 
it actually makes the identification of student strengths a lot easier. However, there's no getting around the fact that teachers must be learners themselves. So we need to learn about content, about language, about child development, about new and emerging genres, about our students and the communities where we live and teach and attending to the ways in which we prepare and support teachers in this endeavor is essential. So the USBI has taken up this challenge across the P16 spectrum. The knowledge and skills that teachers require to do these things well take years to develop and fine tune, which is why we're looking at the education of teachers across their career trajectories from initial recruitment and selection to leadership development as mentors or teacher educators themselves. So with that, um, I know I've covered an awful lot of ground here in a very short period of time, but I wanted to be sure that I left enough time for uh, you in the VI um, to hear from Ms. Gomez about the task force work and also to um, have an opportunity to, to engage in some conversation about that work. So with that, I'm going to pass it off, um, Ms. Gomez, to you. Uh, please, again, don't forget um, that phone lines need to be muted so that you can use your um, mic on your computer. Thanks. I can hear you, but it's very soft. How about now? Helen, Sandra, can you hear me? All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone um, who's tuned in and who's with me in the Virgin Islands. First, I wanted to say thank you to the REL team for the work that you're doing with us and the work that you'll continue to do with us. It's actually exciting work because um, it, it, it's a long-term effort. It's not something that we're going to see a result right away. And so we're, we're in it for the long haul, and I'm looking forward to continuing the work with you. Uh, so my job today was to talk to you about the two Hi, Denise, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm having some trouble hearing you. Is there any way you can hold the mic a little bit closer to your mouth? I can try. How is this? Oh, much, much, much better. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Awesome. So um, it's a holistic approach to the educational process involving multiple agencies coming together to the table. This brings me to think about VIVIS, which is an uh, excellent opportunity for us. It's a virtual um, system 
where we're going to be able to pull data from all those agencies, justice, human services, labor, education, and in the long term, we'll be able to look at a student and see his or her entire history from Head Start, from birth really, all the way to um, whatever job he or she might be holding um, as an adult. So again, it's a long-term effort. It's something that is uh, very holistic and it's, it's, like I said, a very exciting opportunity for us. The teacher leader pipeline uh, is something that we just recently started, maybe uh, two months ago, starting to meet about the teacher leader pipeline. And what we have in the territory is a situation where we have a very high turnover. Our teachers aren't staying with us the way we need them to. Uh, we're bringing teachers from uh, foreign places. And so we need to find a way that we can uh, recruit teachers, select the teachers that we need to work with our students, train them the way we want them to, to deliver their, their services, and then um, you know, continue the process of, of helping them so that they can stay with us, the retention, so that we can have strong instruction for our students. And then, of course, we talk about the, um, you know, keeping, our te keeping the teachers there with us long enough and creating leaders within the classroom, not pulling the leaders out of the classroom, but creating leaders within the classroom who can continue to help sharpen those incoming teachers and existing teachers to provide the best service for our students. Of course, a very important part of this, uh, this whole effort, especially the P16 effort, is the career and technical aspect. It's important that we have strong career and technical education for our students so that we're preparing them while they're young to be productive and uh, pr productive employees in the workforce. So that's another part of the P16 collaborative that I think is very important, the career and college and career and technical education component as well. So it's, like I said, it's a long-term um, effort. We are, we're starting the work and it's going to be something that like, is gonna connect the entire community for the better, betterment of our children now and in the future. So my presentation is quite brief, and I am ready to turn it back over to the REL team. And again, thank you for working with us on this uh, presentation today and being a part of the VI pen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Denise. Um, now we're ready, I think, to have some conversation. Um, Sandra, I think you're going to facilitate this part. Is that correct? I will. I've been um, I've been asking the uh, participants of the webinar that are uh, online to send questions or comments. We haven't got uh, any anything yet, but as we are thinking on the um, on the information that Helen has provided on how to think about literacy and the impact on the, uh, on the students' preparation and how the uh, education um, educational scenarios should be set up to support the students and the teachers. I'd like to invite you to think on your own settings. How have you uh, approached these issues? If you have experiences to share, um, we know that there are attendees to the webinar that are not from the USBI and uh, that is great because one of the objectives of this session was to um, have this uh, exchange of information, how you are doing or do you perceive the work is um, has to be done. Uh, so feel free to um, feel free to type in your questions or to speak up if you are in the room, Denise is over there, and it will be easier if you can talk directly to her, and um, we will find a way through the technology to share your comments to others. Let me pause here to see if there is uh, any comment or question from you, from the group. Denise, I... Um, it's very hard to do this from the distance. If you see any hand raise or if you um, um, get any questions, just um, 
go and uh, and let us know. We seem to be good here. There are no questions. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. There are some that are typing, so let us give this uh, person's uh, time to write, and uh, I will read them. Uh, Ramona Chauvin is asking more information about the CTE work. Is this the CTE on the USBI uh, in particular? I, um, can you talk about that, um, uh, Denise? Or is Ramona, are you referring to this question to Helen? Please be more specific so we can address it. Uh, Ella May Daniel is asking, with regard to the teacher leader pipeline, what assistance is needed? What <clears throat> I can uh, answer this, and Helen and Denise, you can jump in. The, um, the teacher pipeline is a group of individuals, as Denise described to you, from uh, key organizations in the territory that are uh, at this moment, identifying key issues that the uh, uh, four areas in the teacher's pipeline uh, uh, have reflected in the, in the territory. Recruitment is a big aspect of it. And uh, what is being done is that with the Human Resources Office of the Department of Education, some uh, information, data is being gathered. I think that what kind of technical assistance is needed once the recommendations uh, come, come up, I can guess that the data gathering uh, and uh, uh, support to have that data analyzed will be uh, a big effort. Then the RELNI can support the territory with that, as well as other organizations. Some revisions or conversations about the, um, the regulations that attend the, um, the certification process for teachers and leaders is another aspect that has been discussed. So it's soon to determine what specific technical assistance, but um, uh, we, will, we can anticipate that uh, facilitating discussions and uh, analyzing data and helping in determine what kind of data will be needed is uh, some is some of the support that will that will be needed Ramona uh, is asking um, to Helen and to Denise about the work on CTE that was her question so Helen do you want to sure I'll I'll, I'll begin from my perspective and then maybe Denise you can um, kind of chime in with uh, specifically what's going on in the VI with uh, CTE. But um, I think this one of the things I want to point out um, as part of another project that I've been working on uh, in another jurisdiction, we, we actually did um, a survey of prospective employers, of thousands of prospective employers. Um, using the employability skills framework um, that was developed by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Career and Technical and Adult Education. Um, and w it was really interesting. We, we asked uh, both about entry-level uh, employees and more experienced employees where the skills gap may uh, exist and what their desired skills, what the most desired skills were. And you know, it's really interesting because I think a lot of times what we hear is that, you know, we need uh, more students with STEM skills, more students with STEM skills. And you know, while I can't argue with that, um, what we found in our survey is the most um, frequently cited skills employers are looking for are employees, prospective employees who can read and write. So communication skills are paramount uh, regardless of whether you're in a STEM field or not. 
Um, other areas uh, that employers pointed to were non-academic -acad skills, um, you know, uh, such as uh, personal responsibility, integrity, um, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, I just, I guess I want to highlight the fact that, you know, literacy is not something separate from CTE. Um, it's some, it's, it needs to be embedded in the work that CTE teachers are doing as well. So, Denise, I don't know whether you want to uh, kind of weigh in on the the role that CTE teachers or, um, are playing in the, the teacher pipeline uh, work that you've been doing there. Well, I think that uh, the CTE teachers have a lot to offer to the uh, the whole process because a lot of our CTE manuals are written at a level that is already extra challenging for our students, and so. Um, to give them the strategies that they'll need to help our students attack that text is going to be critical. Also, in terms of the uh, P16 collaborative, um, Department of Labor is going to be going to play a critical role in helping us decide what programs our CTE department should be offering to our students so that we can be preparing our students for jobs that are available and in demand in the Virgin Islands as well. Well, I, I also I just want to add, um, Denise, to what you said and, and comment that, um, you know, a lot of times CTE teachers have um, a very clear sense of how the academic skills that students are gaining are applied in the real world. And again, that's an important aspect of um, literacy instruction, right? Sorry, correct? That's correct. Well, we have a couple more minutes left in the in the webinar. Uh, and um, I I haven't seen any additional questions from the uh, from the room in the chat. Uh, if you are thinking on something and we run out of time, feel free to send us your comments. Uh, I provided you my email at the beginning is saespada at gmail.com or you can access us through the RELNI web, www.relni.org and uh, we can certainly address your, uh, your question or provide you with more information. There is um, uh, an assessment of this event that is needed for us to evaluate our work and also to enhance future events such as this. Uh, you will be receiving an email from us on, on that assessment and uh, we will really appreciate if you take a few times on your day and uh, respond to it. Uh, we really uh, use the, uh, the feedback to, to our work. Uh, we have... Um, I, let me go back because Ramona was typing something. Oh, it was a thank you. Thank you, Ramona. And thank you all for the, um, uh, the, uh, for your participation. Thanks to the um, UBI technical staff for the support. Everything worked pretty well, uh, at least on my part here in Puerto Rico. And I think that from the uh, individuals in other states in, in, and in Guam, I hope that this has been um, a useful presentation. Thanks, Helen, for your time in preparing it. And we can, uh, we can continue this conversation in the USBI or in another peer exchange network in, in the near future, I hope. Uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting in the BI. And um, thank you again for participating in this webinar half of uh, the Rel Northeastern Islands. Thanks everyone for joining us today. In a couple of weeks you will receive a thank you email from us with a link to the webinar archive and we appreciate your completing the feedback survey. Have a good evening everybody and uh, you can disconnect. Thanks everyone.